Well, now we're in the mood, ladies and gentlemen, and what gets you in the mood more for AEW wrestling than talking about playing with one's organ? Because <laughs> what else is AEW than someone playing with their organ on national TV? Jim, <sighs> AEW's big pay-per-view event, World's End, a new pay-per-view event from the Nassau Coliseum, Uniondale, Long Island, and it took place a few days ago. Well, December 30th was the official date. If you want to call time of death, that was... Uh... For Worlds NDA, as the guy had the sign in the crowd and et cetera. And let's take, you want to talk a, a little bit about booking philosophy and 101, Brian, a little, a little bit of that at the start of this thing. You know, Tony's the booker of the year. He's going to be just decimated if he doesn't win that thing. There's no way he's going to win for 2023. Well, I mean, it's meaningless to begin with, but you know what I'm saying. But do you want to talk real booking the way real bookers would book the booking? I think that's what how, a lot of the listeners would like to hear, yeah. How much booking would a booker book if a booker could do all the booking? Two hours of TV a week. No, I'm... I'm <laughs> uh, the first match on the pay-per-view was an eight-man tag team match, and the... The uh, reasoning behind this match was it was all the tournament participants, all eight of them, that didn't make it to the finals, like the other two guys, which we'll talk about shortly. That's the only reason. So, so naturally, the, after they've all wrestled each other in round-robin fashion over and over, now well, they're clamoring to see an eight-man tag match, with, and they just pick sides, right? I'm like, what the fuck? It's like a small show in the South in the... 50s like here's the opening match here's the second match now they're gonna have a tag team match and now everyone's gonna have a battle royal <laughs> yeah but there was umpteen more matches and plenty of other mouths to feed on this card and but here's the because tony's mind works very fast all the time i think that's a problem it never does slow down so i'm sure he thought this was going to be fabulous but let me ask you this. The match was Brody King and Jay Lethal and Rush and Light Switch. switch um, slingshot. Slingshot, Jay White. I started to say ping pong. Light Switch. Whatever. <laughs> Versus Claudio Castagnoli, Mark Briscoe, Daniel Garcia, and Brian Danielson. And as I said, the the whole causality of having an eight-man tag match because these were the eight guys that didn't make the finals of the tournament. But now, it, it, looking at it from a business perspective, rather than just Tony thinking that would be cool, right? From somewhat of a professional standpoint. Did that... I, did, I forgot, did they even announce this match was going to happen ahead of time on the pay-per-view? Because they, they were still firming it up the Wednesday before on television. But was this advertised ahead of time? It was. I just don't remember how far ahead of time it was. Okay, certainly certainly not more than like five days ahead of time, but I think it was. Well, because they, they have another eight-man tag team match later on in the show involving Sting and Darby Allen and th that whole angle that we'll talk about with Jericho and the whole nine yards. Oh, yeah, that whole angle with Jericho. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so now they've got an eight-man tag team match to open up the pay-per-view where later on Sting in his final appearance in New York in front of, they had a full house, was it 12,000 people or whatever it was. He's in the second eight-man tag match of the night. So we're having dinner before we have dinner again. And this match, this first eight-man is a cold match only they're only connected any of them because of the tournament if think about how do you want to expose your talent and and your featured talent your top talent i'm not even suggesting tony khan push different people i'm going by the television that he does and who his main event people are in his mind in this match don't you want at least one of them one of them to come out better than than they did going in if 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 nobody bought this pay-per-view specifically to see this eight-man tag i think you'll agree that's a fair assumption right if it was or wasn't on the card was not going to affect the buy rate of the pay-per-view it was an add-on and except maybe it probably would have done great business in sandy fork because of the briscoe family but otherwise so if you're just 
you're opening the show and you want to do something positive for one of your talents, a main event talent that you happen not to have a spot for, for whatever reason on this show, to feature him in a main event money match, at least build for the future, make him look good in some fashion. Why? Instead of, and this thing, by the way, they were 30 minutes into the show before this was over with. And it just wouldn't end. Would you agree with that assessment if you even paid any attention after a while that it just wouldn't end? Yeah, it went on a long time. I mean, it was an opening eight-man tag and everyone has to do their thing. You have to give it time to breathe and <laughs> it went a long time. It, it certainly got, it got CPR in an oxygen tank. It was having no problem breathing. It breathed forever. I love WWE shorter pay-per-views. I know WrestleMania is one of the longer ones and maybe the Rumble will be too, but the pay-per-views they've done that have been like three hours or whatever it's been or feels like three hours lately have been such a breath of fresh air when you know it's going to be like four or five hours. Some of these matches don't need to be there. Well, yeah, they'd already done the hour that they always do before the show, the pre-show before the show. So they've had dinner before they've had dinner. And then they put the eight man on first and they go 30 minutes. So everybody involved in this thing does so many moves that, you know, the rest of the card is somewhat hampered just by, unless they grow another set of arms or legs, what to do. But why not do something positive for someone instead of this mess? And if you, it was three hours and 50 minutes this show. So if they needed to go 30, then they could have had two matches in this spot. But why Brian Danielson wasted in a no money match? He's a, a main event guy. Why would you not? Say, so, okay, we're we're going to do something. If Brian Danielson, did they hide him in an eight-man? Because he certainly doesn't look like he's being hidden that much. But did they hide him in an eight-man because he was injured and doesn't can't go to singles? In which case, as we saw the other night on Raw, you can get a concussion from a fucking drop kick. So maybe he shouldn't be working in the opening fucking match at all. But if he is okay and not banged up, have Danielson and Claudio in a European rules match and let him give the people some fancy wrestling for 12 minutes that both of them would look like athletes and put Danielson over. Or if you're supposedly pushing a fucking sling blade, what's his name? Switch shot, switch shot, uh, switch, whatever the fuck, Jay white, straight shot, straight shot. If you're pushing Jay white, him and Mark Briscoe in a singles match. I think that they may have had in the tournament. It doesn't matter. They got to ask for a rematch. The loser did. Did you know who the loser was? And let Mark get over as a baby face, but then put Jay Switchblade over by cheating and get some heat on him because you're pushing this guy for whatever reason. Or is it possible that you could give the people a feel-good opening match for 12 minutes and have Mark Briscoe beat Jay Lethal and tear the fucking house down and get his hand up for once, and the people would have probably given him a standing ovation. And it would have done something positive. It would have opened the show on some type of professional note without having it. it was it just, oh, I feel bad because I didn't book these guys on the pay-per-view? What the fuck? There's... 14 other fucking matches. I think, I think it was Tony's long-term plan because he loves the tournament that he came up with to have the people that weren't in the finals have a big match at the end. That's what I think. <sighs> you want to talk about booking philosophy? I think that was Tony's booking philosophy. Well, anyway, um, so yeah, so they had an eight man before they had the eight man with actual money drawing stars in it. And Garcia is the one who got the pin for their team beating Lethal. And here's another thing. Brody King is in the house of Black, right? Well, none of his house is around. He's completely on his own. He's standing. To, it, how does it get the groups over? How does it make the groups look when one of their guys is completely disconnected from them and just having random matches with other people as partners? Aren't they... 
Aren't they renegades? Aren't they people who don't do what the man tells them to do over that at the house of Black? Why didn't he just turn out the lights? Yeah, and and slink off. He does that at all other times. Why not here? Same thing for uh, Kill Switch. Um, Jay White was supposed to be a juice is hurt, right? Where's the guns? But he had a group. He had, he had one of the larger groups. And it, no, he's just teaming with random. But Jay Lethal, my God. He was part of a goddamn mob scene surrounding <laughs> Jeff Jarrett. <laughs> Police used to come up and tell him to break it up at ringside. It was such a fucking crowd. <laughs> but he's not with his people. Garcia's with the BBC. Is that a, so is Claudio, but is that a thing? And, he, and Danielson. Well, no, no, Garcia's not. Garcia's. Oh, what if Gar, wait, Garcia wasn't. That he's was with the, the French Canadians. I thought you were going to say the French connection. That's right, Yuda's with the, but Claudio and Danielson were in the BBC, but have they broken free of the the web of the evil cult leader plumber Moxley? No, I don't think they've acknowledged yet that this was a horrible idea from the beginning. The Blackpool Combat Club. And the telltale sign was when the guy from Blackpool quit the company. <laughs> that was like the chance to change this into something realistic as opposed to, I like these guys, let's walk to the ring together. We're cool, we're the thing together. I bleed, they uh, don't. Uh... That have been like the governor of Texas that sent Dusty Rhodes and Dick Murdoch a letter saying, hey, take our state out of your name. <laughs> but anyway, so... Have any yes. of them been to Blackpool? That's one of my questions in this. Have any of them ever stepped foot in Blackpool? I don't know. A couple of them have spent some time in a cesspool, but... So that was the start of the pay-per-view. Uh, in thir about 30 minutes in, it was finally over, and Garcia beats poor Jay Lethal, who apparently was trying to lay down for the fucking popcorn vendor on his way out after the show that night. And uh, do you have any comments that we even need to dignify this? No, I'm bored with a lot of this, and I said it before, I'm not really that excited about Danielson matches lately. They had him buried in this match, and Claudio's been boring me. I hate the way Briscoe's used. Oh, and, and by the way, I think this this followed a battle royal on the pre-show, from what I read. I believe it directly follows. They went from a 20-man battle royal down to a fucking to an eight-man tag team match. I Brody King, I think, could actually do something, but you either got to put him with the group or take him out of the group. Like, figure out what the fuck you want to do with him. Did you ever have the feeling that you wanted to go? Did you ever have the feeling that you had to stay? You wanted to go, but you decided to stay. Jimmy Durante. This was, though, I will say, from watching a lot of the online feedback as it happened, a lot of AEW fans started realizing, well, you know, that really wasn't the greatest opening match or the greatest match here on the show. And it never really recovered from that. There was never anything that was like, man, there it is, AEW. There was nothing. It just kind of kept this pace of banality all throughout the show. Here's part of the problem is, again, not even booking... Tony is not a performer, has never been a performer. That's fair to say, even though he's appeared on oh, television. He's, you, didn't he's see never, this, you didn't see this scrum, his performance. Well, no, there. no, no. And he's never been an in-ring performer, whether it be a manager and a, or an announcer even, or a, a, directly involved, much less a wrestler. And he does not, this is just people doing moves. And a lot of these guys are very good at doing the moves in these matches because that's a lot of what they have on the indies where other marks book them. But it's hard to have any chemistry, whether you're all great workers, but there's four guys on each team. You can't tell a story. You don't have timing with everybody. You're trying to remember umpteen fucking spots. And it just gets repetitive and not. It doesn't showcase anybody to their best example. And I'm not talking about a, a eight or ten man war games match or some big main event spectacular like that. I'm just talking about random multi-man tag matches on the indies, which is what this was. <sighs> the indie audience is different than most wrestling audiences. AEW may have more of that audience than other people, but what was booked by indie people with indie wrestlers on an independent show isn't necessarily reflective of the crowd that would attend a WWE show or 
maybe even some AEW shows. Well, exactly. And that's why basically they've hit their ceiling. Uh, and and I'm sorry if it's controversial and we'll move on, but if, if they've hit their ceiling, which they have on the indie wrestling fans, because by its nature, indie wrestling was not seen on national television. Now, indie wrestling is being seen on national television. And in all the United States of America, there's about 800,000 that wants to watch it regularly. And then whenever a CM Punk or some goddamn celebrity or milestone or whatever would hop along and, and come in, it would increase them a couple hundred thousand, and, and there you go. And that's what everybody's been trying to tell him. He's burnt through so much talent because he didn't, capitalize when he had opportunities he picked some of the wrong talent to begin with because it tickled his indie uvula and you know and and nobody gets over he gets them under uh, moving on the second match was that interesting to you miro and andre with his manager cj miro it was certainly interesting to me because i had heard that andrade was finishing up knowing that Miro has not exactly been a happy camper. <laughs> the weird booking where Miro and his wife are always doing some kind of angle where she leaves him or he's in love with God. I don't know what the fuck is happening, but it's clearly from their own minds. I didn't know what... It's a weird match. It's like in a vacuum. Here's a guy that Tony can't book with anyone because he only wants to do his shit versus a guy that has been desperate to leave this company to the point where he's punching people in the face <laughs> and he's about to leave the company. So yeah, I was interested in this. You weren't? No, that's what I'm saying. I was being sly. Were you interested in this? Because there was so many, so many ways it could go wrong. But no, that's... And by the way, did you see the statistic? Miro, for the year 2023 in AEW, was 6-0. and oh. He worked six times. <laughs> I did not see he that. He worked six times and did no <laughs> jobs. How do you get this job? I'll show up when you do something with me and my wife. Nobody will understand what it is or even whether we like each other or not. And and it'll be confusing. It'll, it'll be rare when it happens. WCW was never this lenient. I do what well, I don't even know if, if he's being lean. I don't know whose idea is this. I mean, would, would, if the rumors are true that for like a year and a half or two years or however long it was, Tony was like, hey, Miro, I got this really great thing. I'm going to book you to lose to, let's just say, Hangman Page. And Miro was like, no, I won't do it. <laughs> All right, stay home. But, you know, <laughs> and then this continued. And now he's doing what he was doing in WWE, an angle with his wife that made no sense on the face of it was ridiculous she looks good i gotta say she's well she's she's she came back from her from her hospitalization you you saw that and she had the the uh, she She had had apparently a life-threatening infection from getting a splinter in her finger and was hospitalized and given Lord knows how many antibiotics and probiotics and prebi all those biotics that the medical science people have these days, and had her finger there in the, in the stylish black cast. So amazingly, she's come back from a near-death experience. These tables are going to kill somebody. I'm telling you. But uh, the, the deal is that she has been trying to manage people, and everybody that she's tried to manage, which or that wanted her to manage them, conveniently who were all job guys miro would beat the fuck out of him you'd never see him again and then finally old andre who's smarter than your average bear and a little tougher than the rest of them he has stepped up here and so she's managing him against miro because we do, we don't know if what the fucking deal is with him she's like i want to do my own thing you know the other thing is everyone knows who his wife is so everyone knows like they're not romantic together. So like she's not with her husband, but she's also managing this other guy who there's Wait nothing Wait a minute, with. I thought that was his wife. Andrade's married to Charlotte, isn't he? No, no, no. I mean, CJ Miro is yeah. Miro's wife. I'm yeah. saying the other way. She came to the ring with Andrade against Miro. Well, yeah, but 
but it, it's purely business. But we the don't... whole thing she's teasing with all these guys is I'm hot and flexible. What do you think that's supposed to fucking mean? Not I'm good with money. Well, it's just a negotiating tactic. Ah. And we don't, we haven't heard that she has to follow through with it. It's just a tagline. Maybe, maybe it's, <laughs> who was it Tim <laughs> Ross said in four rooms? Maybe it's some kind of weird psychosexual game you two are playing. <laughs> But, wow, a four rooms reference. Very yeah, good. Well, you, know, you are an impressive man, I have to say. <laughs> but nevertheless, so the finish was not a mystery because it leaked that Andre was leaving effective pretty much immediately and is going to be a free agent. But Miro jump started it and kicked the shit out of him. And then Andre made a half hearted comeback. And then I started zoning out because it went way too long for these guys, whether they were trying or not. Uh, but finally, Andre got the figure eight a la Charlotte, and old CJ leaned underneath the ropes and jerked her own man, Andre's arms out from under him, and it flattened him out, so he immediately... Let's go of the hold of this big Bulgarian beast that he's got and stands up and looks at her with a shock, like, how could you do this to me and help your husband? <laughs> and, then, and then he turned right around and, and with, you know, completely open and blind and fucking turned right into the big old kick. Boom! And got a two count. It was a two. They can't even do a fuck finish, or they fuck up fuck finishes. Right. I thought that was going to be the finish. Well, if Creed should have been, because he gets a two count, and then Miro gets the fucking camel clutch, and old Andre taps out. And I guarantee you, it Miro ain't. He can't be in any way smart to the wrestling business, even after the background that he has, with the big company, et cetera. Because I guarantee you that he insisted, no, I thought he's leaving. He must tap out to... <laughs> I sound like Sheik now more than Miro. But... It didn't sound anything like Miro. It didn't even sound like The Rock doing the Sheik. Well, how about Sheik doing The Rock? How would you like to hear that? Humbling him. Well, you want to hear the Sheik doing The Rock? No. Yeah. <sighs> Anyway, is he <laughs> so so what would have helped this thing and whatever the fuck it is is if CJ had actually led to the downfall of Andre, but instead she just got a false finish and then Miro just turned him over, and got him to tap out with the camel clutch like every other fucking jabroni. So, like I said, they fuck up, fuck finishes, where people leave with a completely different... They know he won, but it's completely different fucking... What's the word I'm searching for? Sense of feeling of how it happened that leads you to manipulate your emotions in a certain way. What the fuck is that bitch? Whatever the fuck. And then, instead of... Normally, you would see CJ would come in and hug him or raise his hand or cup his balls and check his fucking oil. I don't know. But instead, she never got in the ring, and they never spoke to each other. They looked at each other, and she just wandered around the outside of the ring. And well, that he, settles she that. kind of gestured like Vanna White. <laughs> To the people at ringside, or, you know, I don't know what that was. That is what she did. <laughs> and Miro just stood there and huffing and a puffing. And so I. Thank you for coming, Andre. Uh, you're <laughs> about to be significantly upgraded, I would imagine. You know, I had heard, and I guess other people had heard that Andre. Uh, Andre. Andrade El Idolo was leaving before the match, before the pay-per-view. If you remember WrestleMania, I guess, 20 at Madison Square Garden, they booed Brock Lesnar and Goldberg the fuck out of the building because they found out they were both leaving. It was like, boo, you know, you don't want to be here, fuck you! Yeah. No one gave a shit here in this building. <laughs> yeah. They just watched it like a match, not like, oh, this is the last we're going to see Andrade here. No, they just had no reaction to any of that news. Whatever and that means. And to be fair, they uh, the Nassau Coliseum in Long Island 
Which, well, that's where they were, correct? That is correct, my old that's, hometown that, arena. But that is a notoriously hard building. I've talked about it. I talked about it when I when we were there for Crockett, I, when I worked there for the WWF, when you would have thought that, you know, they're not as expressive there as most places. But in in some cases, they they had no fucking reason to be here. Uh and uh, anyway, should we go on now to the next contest, Brian? Well, that's two matches. So far, people at home who are hardcore AEW fans, from what I saw online, are like, when's this show going to pick up? Well, it didn't pick up here because the next match was the Women's Championship with Timeless Tony Storm versus Riho. Jesus. God, you all right? I'll be okay, kid. There was no editing applied to that, ladies and gentlemen. That's actually so, what you just did. Amazing. I just, I just thought I'd see what I... So again, that was better than this fucking match. What? <laughs> How does Kenny... Kenny... Our friend Kenny... How does he have this much pull with Tony Khan? And why, if you had this much pull, would you use it for this with a billionaire, for fuck's sake? If you can talk Tony Khan into using this poor, mousy little, innocent-looking, totally oblivious and unprepared featherweight fucking minute microscopic amoeba of a girl as a professional wrestler, you can get somebody to do any goddamn thing, can't you? Could he just walk up to Tony and say, Tony, start turning cartwheels across the goddamn floor? I think if Tony hired you, you would be able to get any of your friends hired, get them booked. If you get to be really good friends with Tony, you could probably book your own shit. I mean, the sky's the limit with Tony Khan. Well, the problem is I don't have any friends that are under fucking 50, except for you. I ain't working You don't there. want booked either. I'm not working there. All right, so anyway, so, so apparently next on the agenda is a serious push for a trained kangaroo on this program. And uh, poor Tony Storm. What, uh, I mean, at it, it least, again, I think we might have said it earlier on the, uh, talking about the TV show. They have a couple of girls that will get over to some degree and attract some level of their audience in the United States. Timeless Tony Storm probably being right now the preeminent example. The people won't totally just go, Pfft. but Jesus Christ, this is embarrassing. And, uh, and counting the video package they did on it, 16 minutes. And finally, Tony Storm hits some... Fucked up looking finish, to be honest. I don't know how that you can, it's, it, it would be like trying to work with a goddamn medium-sized rutabaga. How can you even give Riho any moves uh, that she's so small? It, anyway, you didn't watch any of that, did you? Uh, I did watch it. It wasn't good. Tony Storm is entertaining. Like, I wish she was, like, outside of wrestling, just, like, you know, today on the Drew Barrymore show, time was Tony Storm. And then like, who's this wacky character? And then she's on like the Tonight Show next week or different things outside of wrestling. Okay, I got it. It would be really entertaining. It's horrible on this wrestling show. Um, They've just, gone too far. It's horrible. Riho sucks. Whoever doesn't think she sucks, it's like watching your own kid perform in a talent show or something. <laughs> it's like you're waiting for them to do something. Yeah, yeah. The other person has to do everything. Tony Storm was like Kota Ibushi wrestling a doll. You have to do everything because this person can't. She's not good at this. And she doesn't even have like expressions or anything. <laughs> like expressions. Like nothing. Like she gets kicked in the gut. She's like ready to just go run somewhere else. Like well, nothing. Of course. She always looks like the, the deer is looking at the headlights and you're bearing down on it. The hard truth, despite Mercedes Monet possibly being about to sign, AEW should have never had a women's division. AEW still shouldn't have a women's division. Just because WWE did doesn't mean you should. There isn't the talent there. 
There isn't the reason to devote that television time to something that's going to drive away the portion of your audience, never increase it. And in AEW, it never gets better. It never gets better. If you want to test it out, give them their own show. But it dra- it's the bathroom break on Dynamite. It drags down every show it's on. It's the bathroom break on the pay-per-views too. What's the point of it? Is it just to appear? Well, so the point of it is pe- people have to goddamn violate their bowels and empty their bladder at some point, Brian. That's the point of it. I guess so. I mean, how do you divide? I don't know. Forget it. Forget it. <laughs> The next match, Brian, let me ask you what you think this did for anybody's business. Swerve Strickland versus... Now, I should preface, it was supposed to be that red-hot angle finally coming to a boiling point with Swerve Strickland versus Keith Lee. Remember, because... Swerve broke a cinder block over him about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, as we recall, barely, only because it was so preposterous at the time that you could double stomp a goddamn cinder block into a fat man's belly and it would powderize itself instead of the belly being ripped asunder. Nevertheless, they're finally going to have a match. And then earlier in the day or the day before, whenever it was, Keith Lee is injured. He apparently got injured on the Ring of Honor pay-per-view that apparently happened at some point. And is the, should we just call it, should we call it on Keith Lee and everybody go home? It doesn't look like the rain's going to let up. What do you think? I don't know. I trying to remember where it was. I read an interview or quotes with him from a few days before, and it was like, "I'm really banged up. I'm hurting, but I'm doing everything I can to make it to the pay per view." And then they announced he was off the pay per view. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to think. I mean, I liked him in NXT. Whatever issues he had on the main roster under Vince McMahon as the Bearcat, who knows. Uh, now, I'll the- tell you what, Bearcat Lee looks good from what he's done the last two years. But he got to AEW, and in that time, I mean, the only thing he had going, I guess, was the tag team with Swerve. And then they broke up and never did anything again other than Rick Ross called him a big motherfucker on live TV. <laughs> and then they had no feud. That was it. And wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I just realized something. They have made history. Never before in the history of the wrestling industry since television went on the air and was invented has the shining, most memorable moment of a wrestler's career with a promotion on television being have been being called a motherfucker. <laughs> you know, and then the other thing he was trying to get there, and then Tony Khan said he wasn't cleared. So what exactly is the injury? What wasn't he cleared to wrestle for? I don't know, but remember, and I'm not making fun of this guy's health and injury. I'm saying perhaps this is not going to work. Remember, he was off for months and months with a COVID-related problem. And then he's been injured multiple times. And as well, he his weight seemed to fluctuate somewhat, let's say that. And he's getting, he's in his late 30s. We've looked that up. It might be that he's starting to damage himself with, with not a large element of return on the horizon, especially the way that these imbeciles have booked him. And that, to be honest, he apparently insists on talking like he talks in the promos, which doesn't do him any favors. And it, the, the, we've seen his match for the last year or two, whether it's injury or illness related. A couple of amazing feats of agility for a guy that size and a lot of slow nothing. And the slow nothing has been increasing and the feats of agility have been decreasing. So anyway, nevertheless, Keith Lee was not involved in this. It was Dustin Rhodes, that red hot goddamn program. Um, And I, I wrote at the time... As you know, as soon as they're coming to the ring, I said, "Okay, 
at least this is going to be a better match, and Dustin Rhodes will lead this thing, and we're going to see how good Swerve really is without doing the aggressive parkour and the excessive tumbling that he sometimes finds himself getting lost in the weeds with when he, one of with one of his age generation, right? I'm thinking this will be a real good old-fashioned wrestling match with a fucking professional like Dustin Rhodes leading it. Boy, howdy, they're going to tear the building down. I didn't realize they were going to do an angle in a fucking cold match to make Swerve now not only a baby terrorizer, but the most popular legend mutilator in fucking... If it takes you 20 minutes to mutilate a legend. Well, but... It, it, this and, went and a it, long time. Yes, and at the same time, they did a, a, they did a hospitalization angle followed by a 20-minute match. Which was and good was, for what it was. <laughs> but no, there was, there was a reason for this. So let me tell the people, because I'm sure most of you listening did not see this. Before Dustin can step through the ropes, Swerve jump starts it and knocks him to the floor and posts him and runs him into the rail a couple of times and into the stairs and gives him a running knee into the stair sandwich type of maneuver. What a maneuver. Pulls out a cinder block. Prince Nana holds Dustin's ankle on the cinder block. Swerve gets up on the apron, milks it forever. Dustin is he's, he's having to lay there and keep his leg on the cinder block. And then he does the double stomp off the apron onto the ankle on the cinder block, which breaks. It doesn't powderize at least this time, but it does break. And nobody was trying to help. The referee was standing there, mouth agape, arms akimbo. Dustin sold the ankle big, but then suddenly, as soon as the guy who was standing in front of the firing squad has been shot, the fucking doctor rushes in to see if he can save him. Why didn't you say, wait, don't shoot, mother... All the doctors and the referees are checking the guy with the fucking obviously broken leg because how would the bone not break if the cinder block did? And I'm thinking, do the... Uh, Swerve is the most popular baby... or most popular heel in wrestling. The people like him. But do they do they want to cheer him so he terrorizes infants and cripples legends? What is the psychology behind this, right? And I'm thinking, okay, I'm thinking Dustin's going to be taken out and somebody's going to come in to, you know, take up for him and get even for him or whatever that's going to lead to a big match with Swerve. Maybe they'll shoot an angle or whatever. And the doctors and the referees are helping Dustin to the back and Swerve standing there in the ring. And Dustin turns around and he wants to go back. And now they've been helping him. Now they turn around and they're helping him limp to the fucking ring. What? Wait, what the fuck? I understand breaking loose from goddamn people and running back to the ring but when you have the people that are helping you because you can't walk say no turn me around Dave help me back I'm, I can't walk but fuck it I'm going back in there and they do it including the doctor that's so concerned with the health and safety of the athletes in the safest wrestling company in the world <laughs> and Dustin rolls in the ring and talks to the referee forever and I'm thinking I'm seriously what no they can't and Dustin pulls himself up to his feet, and the referee rings a fucking bell. And now, I'm thinking, after a hospitalization angle, they're going to have a match. And it went again on and on. I won't even bother to tell you the preposterosity and the ludicrousness is, 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 of... And, I mean, Dustin, he was making a comeback. He got false finishes. They went back and forth some. He got to punch Nana. Nana took a nice bump. Dustin did all kind of shit. It, it, with the, and then, finally, the finish was Swerve kicked him that sideways kick in the head twice. 
and hit the double stomp off the top one, two, three. In the flattest finish to the stupidest angle that I've ever seen, the, it, it, actually it was it was ten minutes bell to bell after the the whole rigmarole with the uh, cinder block and the attack and the breaking of the ankle and etc. But what the fuck are they doing? This is the point where I had to take a break from the show. I was watching it on DVR and I said, "Fuck it." I went and. And did, I can't even remember what I did for a couple hours, but I didn't want to see any more of this. What, uh, help me with this. Why? You could have either done the angle or done the match. Or done the angle after the match. I mean, you didn't have to do it this way. (laughs) Or if you were going to do the angle and then the match, the match had to be like 30 seconds. Dustin did a great job. Not saying anything about, I'm not saying Dustin didn't do a great job. He was great. He's always great. It's, it's the reasoning behind all of this that makes no sense. Again, Swerve <laughs> is becoming a bigger and bigger baby face by just being a heel, which says a lot about the fan base there. <laughs> but it doesn't help him too, even though he won and he beat up Dustin. It took him forever to do it. And this also may not have been the place in the card. This was the place in the show to do this if it was five minutes or less. Not if it was this long, coming after everything we had just seen. Well, there's more to see. The eight-man tag team match number two that was put together from the angle on Wednesday night, Dynamite, where the people just ran in and out and were routed and left and other people came to attack and take their place. Remember with staying in Jericho and Darby Allen and Sammy and Starks and big bill and Hobbs and take a shit and the Don Fallis organization. Shammy. 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 And of course, Wednesday night, as we mentioned earlier in this broadcast, if, if you hadn't heard it, If you haven't already heard, you will hear, like Nick Goulas used to say. This was before the Jericho um, controversy became a thing on social media. So on Wednesday night, he was, they were just kind of, huh, okay. But tonight, it's all sunk in on him. And they gave him the entrance first. And, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, the people were still singing. Is it possible the song, they still like the song, but they hate the singer? Don't hate the sin, hate the sinner, or what is that old saying? But They like audience participation. Well, Anything there you with, go. This is a, the era of audience participation, whether it's The Rock making them say corny things or whether it's an awful song by an aging wrestler. They just want to participate. Watch how you bandy the word corny around. But so oh, I'm sorry, I didn't even realize that. Yeah. They they, they had the music up loud and uh they had lots of singing, and then when they cut the sing they cut the music, there was some singing and then the booze started, but then they quickly transitioned to Sammy's music. And I think they were pretty goddamn blase either way, to be honest, on whether Sammy walked out there or not, in my estimation. I don't know that the people were really stirred in, in their loins one in a positive or negative fashion. He's the perfect example of someone who's been booked under because he switched back and forth so many times. When the fans were ready to accept him as a babyface, whatever, the way he was booked, the way he was used, his no, behavior. No, remember, remember he was starting it over as a heel and he hurt himself and he was booked like an idiot. He was starting it over as a babyface and that's when people found out that he really was kind of a dick in person. And then it was him and his wife, and they were a heel combo that the yeah. fans really did hate. And now he's back, and he has a baby, so that makes him a baby face, I guess. Well, yeah, certainly, you know, can you imagine if they'd have kept her on TV, coming out pregnant, being a real bitchy fucking whining moaning, oh my goddamn, my goddamn ovaries hurt, and oh my goddamn hemorrhoids. Don't give them ideas, please. Well, it's too late now. Let's, Let's try it with someone else. Well, I can't, I, there are apparently a lot of people in that company are trying to get other people pregnant. But anyway, back to this match. So then Sammy's entrance stopped while he was still in the aisleway. He's partners with Jericho, he go, but they just transitioned to Darby, and Darby's music played for like 15 seconds, and he stopped on the ramp 
to wait for Sting. And then Sting's music plays, and it's the biggest babyface reaction of the combination for a 65-year-old man because he's the biggest star. But why? I understand when baby faces stop on the ramp to wait for their partners when the heel team is in the ring. You don't want to get in outnumbered. But Sammy, his entrance got cut off, and Darby just got 15 seconds to wait until his big brother Sting came out so that he could, I guess, ride him piggyback. There was no single spotlight for these guys with their own team in the ring. That makes no sense. And then Stark's music, and here comes him and Large William, and then the Fallis family. And we mentioned it was slapped together, you know, on the Wednesday night TV after they had gotten the news about Kenny having problems with his guts. After the issue with the painting. Well, and, and you know, but Jericho was originally going to be with Kenny against the tag team champions and blah, blah, blah. So they had to start from scratch with all of that chaos. And here again, we mentioned in the preface on Jericho from the start of it, they the, the fans clearly liked a couple of people in the match. They clearly didn't give a shit whether a couple people in this match were in it. And they definitely didn't want to approve of anything that Chris Jericho did. So as a result, when Sammy tagged Jericho in, they booed. And the spinner with Sammy and Jericho's pose, they booed. But then... And it wasn't a Don Callis, Dominic Mysterio booing where people were smiling. It was a statement booing. And no, it was like, oh, just a steady, ooh, we don't want you. We, ooh, we want you to hear this. And then, but then other guys would get in. And by the way, what was Big Bill trying to do to Jericho, though? Was he trying on purpose to pick him up just randomly and throw him in the air and drop him on his head to get over with the crowd? Because he did it like twice where you didn't know what he was trying to do and Jericho didn't look like he knew how he was supposed to land. If you watch this match with the idea that the people wrestling Jericho are pissed at him just like the fans are and don't want to be in there with him, you can come away from it believing that. <laughs> Ricky Starks giving him the middle finger and getting out of the ring while the fans oh. cheer him doing it. <laughs> I mean, that was an amazing moment. Oh, my God. It, anyway, <laughs> I don't know what... Maybe Bill was being paid under the table to try to take Jericho out, but that was sloppy at, at best. And then Darby and Take-A-Shit would get in there and they'd go 100 miles an hour. And, you know, Take-A-Shit would stop him and do a spinning power bomb of some kind off the top rope, and I'm looking and people were on their fucking hands. And you would think they'd be, you know, they would ooh if it looked like somebody really got hurt. But they, the crowd was not, they, they actively wanted to appreciate staying his last time in New York and they wanted to tell Jericho, fuck you verbally. And otherwise, there was no life to this match in the ring or in the crowd. And did you see the part where Big Bill and Hobbs get in there and, and grab Darby like the old hammock throw thing, right? Arms and legs. And they're standing there ready to throw him 20 feet across the ring, uh, you know, get ready, get set. And none of Darby's partners are even blinking an eye or making a move to try to stop it or to try to be blocked off by the referee or what. <laughs> they're just getting it over with. And then finally, Darby, oh, and they they chanted, we want Sting finally, right? As I think Darby took the hint, and he gave Sting a hot tag. It was actually a hot tag, miraculously enough. And the comeback was sloppy because he's 65. But it was the, it, it, they finally came back to life because that was the, he's the star. And then when Jericho came in to help Sting's come back, they started booing again and started chanting Kylie Ray and NDA and that stuff. Uh, you know, and they they then went back into more goddamn match. And it just, the action stopped for a second. Well, more than a second, but for a few minutes. And then it went back to being, there's there's no reaction. Until Jericho then hit a code breaker on Bill and got booed again. And that's one of the times where he, Big Bill picked him up and dropped him in a heap. 
And it was the dichotomy of where they were cheering and booing, not for a, a side to win or a team to win, but individual people that they liked or didn't like in the goddamn mixed up eight man tag match bullshit. And I'm not sure that take a shit should be having his shit. No sold by fucking sting. They've just minimalized. Yeah, why not? They've they've done nothing right by him since he first got used as a heel and was getting over. And you were like, wow, there's your next top heel. This guy's great. And since that time, he's been buried. Yeah. I don't even mean buried just in the booking, buried in the background. And he doesn't know how to fight for himself. And English is his second language. So he needs a boy. Can you imagine what Gary Hart would be doing with him right now? Can you imagine if instead of Gary Hart, the great Muda was listening to Kenny and Don Callis and people no, like that? <laughs> I mean, that's the problem. But anyway, so and then they they had the part of, as I said, where I think that was, yeah, Jericho gets in and puts the walls of Jericho on Hobbs and they boo. They boo the baby face for punishing the heel. But then Sting got the scorpion on take a shit right next to him and they cheered and then stark super kicked jericho and they cheered <laughs> and then stark speared sammy and they cheered um and is i believe like, whose side are they on <clears throat> and finally sammy went up to the top and took a while and gave the shooting star press to ricky starks one two three starks got beat by sammy guevara Starks is one of the two people they actually responded to positively all throughout this man and Darby three and <laughs> Sammy, the guy that universally everybody was like, fuck, or should I say <laughs> he gets the pin. And uh, did we notice, did we notice that finally the only time the people actually stood up and cheered and showed appreciation was after the other team was out of the ring and everybody gave Sting his last hurrah. And Jericho, of course, was the last one to back out of the ring to do that. But that was the excitement was appreciating Sting for his last time in New York. This was... For a really, really bad match that fell apart, it was quite a spectacle. It was like one of those really bad matches you can't take your eyes off. Something has to improve it. Nothing ever improved it. And Jericho was the problem. The problem also is when you have an audience that's more smart fans than family fans, I don't know what you want to call it. Casual may not even be the word anymore. The people that get over aren't the people that... You're, you, the baby faces aren't going to get over like baby faces. The heels aren't going to get over our like heels. The people that are good at what they do and are used well are who are going to get over or who they want to see used better. Yes, yeah, sometimes sometimes people get get over with the fans when they're used like shit out of sympathy. Well, Ricky Stark's a great example of that. Yeah. He's been booked like shit for a long time, and the fans chose him a while ago. They never gave up on that. Jericho, he got Sting booed. He had to get out of the rings. They were booing <laughs> Sting at the very end. They better figure out a way to deal with this. This isn't going away. And here's an update, and we'll tie this into the show somehow. But Nick Houseman has put out a tweet saying he has not walked back anything. Oh! That he's not the one who put the name Kylie Ray out there. And whatever he's referencing, he's not walking back. So this isn't going away. They better so figure out how they're going to deal with it. In an unwieldy fashion, expressing sympathy for her name being drug into this, that he didn't do it. But he's not saying that. He doesn't stand by any of his other reporting. And is Jericho going to start? I mean, they're going to pull Jericho from Dynamite? They're in Newark, I think, tonight. It's the same market. <laughs> it's the same market as the Nassau Coliseum. Oh, those New Jersey assholes. I mean, where is he going to be able to work that people aren't going to react to this if it's never addressed and never denied and doesn't go away? And then if anything else trickles out, if they're booking him on TV or doing anything with the idea that something could trickle out, they're going to look like fools if they know about it. And if they pull them because they're waiting for something to come out, then what the hell's going on? This is a no-win situation for anyone involved. Did you have to say trickle out? You have a problem with trickle? 
Could it have been just drip out? Trickle sounds so much more off-putting than drip. All right, well, we can go with drip. Ric Flair goes with the drip, apparently, when he's uh, doing whatever he's, scheme he's, he's up to. <laughs> dripping and wooing and winging and... Uh, speaking of... Speaking of trickling out, uh, the next match on the pay-per-view, and pay-per-view, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, means that we are supposed to pay for it, correct? They gave us, for the TBS title, Julia Hart versus Abandoned. I'm sorry, Abaddon. And the special stipulation for this match, because God knows they needed one, was biting is legal. On a show we're paying for that was nearly four hours plus the hour pre-show, they're going to do this to us. <laughs> and all I will say is that Abaddon needs to abandon wrestling before she gets hurt because I don't think she's cut out for this. It looks like trying to work with a bowl of stale pudding. She's going to get hurt. There's nothing. Did, did you watch any of this? I didn't because I needed a break after that. Uh, that Jericho match was something I yeah. had it on in the background, but I had to see what the reaction online was at a Jericho match. Well, anyway, um, moving alongward. Did anything happen? I mean, Julia won. I don't know. I don't care. I'm. I don't know if people were taken out with a spatula. Did you see that footage that was on Twitter of? Julia Hart's entrance from like a fan cam or fan cam a phone. I I didn't I did not. Did they did they do some kind of upskirt type of situation or she comes out on the stage, she's slowly singing her song with the lights going. The cameraman and the guy holding the cord are right in her face. <laughs> you know, you never think about what it looks like for the rest of the arena. Well, yeah, yeah. They're right in her face as she's slowly walking and lip syncing. And then the lights go out and you see her run as fast as she can <laughs> into the ring to get herself in position so that she's draped over the second rope with her hand in the air. You know, I don't know. What are they doing? What are they doing? <sighs> well, speaking of what are they doing, one of the matches I was looking forward to, unfortunately, again, let me down. Some of my almost peers, they're the the next generation down from me, uh, the TNT title, no disqualification. That should have been the tip-off. I was just paying attention to the fact it was Edge versus Christian. Christian, of course, accompanied by Nick Plain and Nick Plain's mom. And I thought, okay, before I... <laughs> Before I dwelled on the no DQ stipulation, uh, right after Edge's entrance, when the fight began on the stage slash ramp of the thing, I th two professionals, <laughs> again, two guys that can work their ass off if they want to, and they should have some element of psychology if they just use the ring. Boy, we'll see some of the element of the art of professional wrestling. And instead, because I get Edge is retiring, they want to have fun. They want to do. They want to tickle the kids in the back, the indie wrestlers that did what they did. Because Edge and Christian came up with all this ladders, tables, and chairs bullshit, and pretty much led to a goddamn ruination of the business. Now that I think about it, but they could have had a fucking match, but they didn't. And it, it, it at least they're over, so it woke the fans up. I hated to see it because they're so much better than this type of thing. But the people wanted to see it. And they worked hard and they were serious, even though what they were doing in some cases was preposterous. And Edge is a hell's angel now. He looks like Don Fargo. But... From the start, when they were in the fucking ring, the crowd was chanting, we want tables. They they have partially led to ruining the fans because you know, we want tables. We want fucking whatever the fuck. And then they run up into the general admission seats and they have the fight up the stairs and then the 
fight in one of the what do you call the level there, Brian, between the real cheap seats and the fucking lower cheap seats, the fucking aisleway there. The mezzanine reserved. There you go. And then Edge jumps off one of the railings and crossbodies both because Nick's up there too. And they get the holy shit. And then they do the fight walk down the stairs again. I wrote, I'd love them to start their match. And they went back to ringside and got back in the ring. Edge went for a spear. Christian sidestepped it. Edge went into the post and they went back to the fucking floor. And I'm like, God damn it. God damn it. God damn it. Ah, I go to the next page of my notes. So then apparently at that point, I guess it was a potato Christian gave kind of a curb stomp and effect thing to Edge's face on the stairs and rolled him in and got a two count, and it looked like it was a potato because Edge's eyebrow was not only busted open and bleeding, but it was swelling up like a, a goddamn a potato over his eyebrow there. That I didn't see anything else that would have done that, so I think it may have been that stomp. I don't know. But then Christian pulls out two kendo sticks, and I wrote, I've given up hope. And then Nick Plain threw in two chairs, and Christian sat one chair on top of Edge and posed with it, and then put the Boston Crab on Edge while sitting in the chair that was sitting on Edge's back. And now I said... Before I said at least they were being serious, now I was, I'm losing patience. And then Christian throws, he's got two folding chairs, right? Two metal folding chairs. He throws one chair out of the ring and ignores the other one completely and goes over and asks Nick for a small metal rod off of a chair. Because remember, Edge has done the thing where he puts the cross face on the guy with the fucking metal rod from the chair in his mouth in the other company and blah, blah, blah. And of course, when Christian did that, it gave Edge time to get up and knock Christian on his ass. So you've got a goddamn chair. You've got two chairs. You throw one away and you ignore the other one to take time to go over and ask a guy for a fucking... Metal rod about as big around as your index finger, about 18 inches long. The fuck? And then they wore each other out with the kendo stick and put the cross face on and put the rod in the mouth. And then Edge pulled out a ladder. I'm trying to get to the point here because, uh, yeah, they boomeranged Christian into the ladder. I wrote, are they almost done? Christian went up the top of the ladder, but Edge climbed up the other side, and then Christian gave Edge a sunset flip powerbomb off the top of the ladder, two count. And then Christian threw the ladder out to the floor and pulled out two tables. And I said, fuck it, this is unbearable. I'm fast-forwarding to the finish. Six more minutes after he pulled out two tables. Apparently, Christian... And Nick Plain set a table at ringside and set it on fire and tried to throw Edge on it, but Edge made a comeback and then set the, either another table at ringside or that was the same one, but he had to go down and spray the lighter fluid back on it again to relight it. And then he powerbombed Nick off the apron, allegedly through the flaming table, but in trying not to put him down right on the flames, he goddamn threw him over the table and the back of Nick's head hit the fucking concrete and he turned the table over and it was a complete outlaw mud show at this point. Just a fucking parody, a complete farce of anything to do with a wrestling show. And in Edge hit his finish on Christian 1-2-3 and won the title. But then the dinosaur, Dino Douche, came out and knocked Edge on his ass, and then Christian made Dino give Christian the title shot contract that Dino had won doing whatever the fuck he did, and then Christian covered Edge one, two, three, and won the belt back three minutes later, or less. 
And this took a long fucking time, too. Did you like any of this better than I did? This was so bad. And I've not been a fan of Edge's comeback, to be fair. But this was really bad. And I thought to myself, at least they gave everyone that moment. Because there was a massive pop when he won. And he got the belt. All right, at least they get that. And then they immediately, (laughs) immediately (laughs) negate all of that. With something, again, even their own fans are like, why do this now? <laughs> the overbooking even here in this overbooked match. So, no, I didn't like it. Thought it was counterproductive. It doesn't make people want to see more of Adam Copeland. It makes people want to see less of Adam Copeland when he gets, when he has a match like this and you get a good moment and then you take it immediately away. That doesn't have a good effect on people. So, really bad. Really bad. This show is the worst AEW pay-per-view by far. If it could, Tony can't stop. He can't control himself. He's like Russo on meth. I thought the shit stain was bad. It, you can't stop this fucking guy. <clears throat> so anyway, then they had the tournament final for every miscellaneous belt that Tony likes featuring the plumber against Eddie Kingston. I've made my views clear on how Kingston could have been used, been successful, been, you know, somehow featured despite some of his own worst tendencies or instincts or whatever. But I couldn't, I couldn't suffer through this with this show going this long with that. And what was left for these two to do after you've had tables and chairs and fire and ladders and chaos and stars? You could have them stand in front of each other and take turns hitting each other with the other one's permission. It was horrible. And I like Eddie Kingston. I'm starting to think I just really hate everything that makes Eddie Kingston want to wrestle the way he wrestles. This match wasn't good. This match match wasn't good. I had to see the, the, the Twitter spot they put out because somebody put the split screen between the, as it was described, the bitches slap fight that Moxley and Kingston had side-by-side side with Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels trading punches with each other, and it was fucking embarrassing. It looked like two drunk women at a bachelorette party. And and these are two guys who try to do a lot of shit that you can't work well to begin with if you're really good, and they're not, so it looks like shit, and it hurts. You can pop a guy's eardrum with one of those stupid slaps. It looks like fucking shit. It looks like ain't Lola. It's just so fake, and at the same time, reckless and unnecessary. Because it's that goddamn Japanese strong-style bullshit that ain't gonna ever be over here to any degree and it's done poorly and it's done out of poorly. context yeah you can't compare it to even what they did in japan in the 90s or anything well no because they, they i love all that stuff brain damage for real i love all that stuff the same way eddie kingston does they never just stopped the match and just started standing there and as slow <laughs> as they can laying shit in it's just not good and everyone's doing it and it's not like the flying tackle or the hip tossing, and it shouldn't be a regular part of the wrestler's repertoire. This match wasn't good. This tournament was a waste of time. The creation of another championship, combining other championships for no good reason, was done for no good reason. Eddie got the pop in front of the hometown crowd. That's what this was all about. With a, with a, with a backhand slap. When Eddie used to come out on the mic... From that first time he came out and tore into Cody and all the early stuff when they had him with Santana and Ortiz and Penta was his best friend or someone else was his best friend. That was that stuff was good and compelling even when it was bad. (laughs) But his work in the ring, he has to he likes wrestling a style that doesn't look good on him. It doesn't he doesn't pull it off well. Yeah. And I feel bad saying that because he clearly loves it as much as anyone loves any style of wrestling. Well, and also at this point, getting a dream job where you're making six figures a year after trying and toiling in relative obscurity for that period of time, and it's been, what, three, four years, three years now or whatever, he could have lost some weight. He could have lost some weight. You know, I just want to see him on the mic. Like I said, I wasn't even talking about his early matches. On the mic, he's money. People would want to hear him every week if he was involved in stuff. Instead, he 
pops up here and there and you have to watch his matches. And I think anyone who gets into Eddie talking, if you watch one of these matches and it's 15 minutes of this, it's rough. You don't want to see it again. Well, speaking of not wanting to see anything again, we come to the main event. The, the match, the one match that you would want to see on this show, and after suffering through the rest of this thing, at this point, I just wanted to get it over with. And I wonder how many other people felt like that. Like, okay, let's see what the fuck. And it's a disservice to the guys in the match. But anyway, they did a number of disservices. Uh, it's for the AEW title. Samoa Joe against MJF. And they give Joe his entrance, and then they have to do the video on the screen, and it can't even be serious. I think MJF is maybe getting a little too cute. The local citizens commentary on MJF, but the girl has to mention, oh, and yeah, then we fucked in the back seat of the... It, there was a lot of comedy in this, which was out of place, I would think for such a serious match with the champion going in injured and a big reveal of a long-running angle, at least being teased, and as we found out, going to happen, such as it was, I mean, just, can they just not, can they just not, I don't know what to say, do they have to diminish everything? Was that a question? Yes. What, would can they not? Yeah, can they just not? Can they just not make everything somehow funny or silly or call attention to their tongue and their cheek on the main event shit they get us to pay for? No, they the need The devil to. is going to be revealed as trying to apparently murder MJF or abduct him to a deserted island somewhere. And it, Samoa Joe is so goddamn compelling as an evil, badass fucking kind of guy and but they gotta and then mjf of course you know a great new outfit for the for the match and the fans chant he's our scumbag which we've established apparently the root meaning of that is a used condom and then adam cole gets his music and entrance and he comes out on crutches and in a cast and he's going to be in the corner for mjf and apparently Nobody's going to say anything bad about this, including Joe. Why does he? Uh, nevertheless, <laughs> and MJF is in a shoulder and arm brace because he's hurt and fucked up. And I, you can't even critique this match. They did. Again, it was the closest thing to two professionals doing their thing without being ridiculous. They did big shit you'd remember, but not too much of it. MJF did all of his stuff that gets over with the crowd. I think there's a little bit too much kangaroo kick milking, especially when it doesn't work twice in a row, you know. But they're both good, great workers and great at putting matches together that make some sense. And under this circumstance, it did. They kept it interesting. And, and they went a while, and then... So there's nothing to... As I said, too much kangaroo milking and kangaroo foiling, I should have said. Uh, because if it doesn't work a couple times in a row, just take it out. But uh, basically, nothing to say about the match. It's all about what the fuck's going on with these people after the finish, which was Joe gets the sleeper, MJF shoves Joe into the buckle, and they squash the referee in the corner, and then MJF gives the laugh like he did it on purpose. And did you see what the fans did immediately when the referee went down, Brian? What's that? I learned this uh, in, in when I first got into business in the early 80s. When you are doing too many run-ins, whenever the referee goes down, if the fans immediately oh. stand up and look to the entranceway. That's what started killing the horseman matches in the late 80s. Yes. When they stand up and look to the entrance you're doing too many run-ins. And that's exactly what they did. But now, of course, they weren't even getting a run-in until later. But it shows they're doing too many of them. 
and MJF nutshotted Joe on the ropes and hit the fireman's or got a fireman's carry and hit an F5 on Joe, and that got a a big pop. And then the cover and the referee had gone down and been squished. And it was such a bad count because he comes over like he's weak and feeble recovering and then does the most animated, violent, <laughs> sharp <laughs> count one and then is feeble and can't move and then does the same thing too. Like, he, like he's being electric shocked into counting it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that? I, I didn't think of it in that context, but you're not lying. You're saying yes. What in, instead of laying there and feebly go one, two, he's like, "Oh, I can't get there out of one. Oh, I can't do it again out of two. And then MJF asks Adam Cole for give me the dynamite diamond ring, and Cole can't find it. He starts looking in his by this pocket, and that pocket, and his sling, and whatever the fuck. And finally, he gives it to MJF, but Joe has grabbed the sleeper from behind. And MJF rolls backwards, but Joe gets it again. And MJF goes to sleep. And the referee drops his arm three times and calls for the bell. So that's different. Um, the lack of outraged reaction before a hometown crowd or the lack of reaction. I know, like they said, the crowd went quiet when Bruno lost the belt. And now this uh, it wasn't the same thing. Right. But that, that this, was interesting. This was, too. that was, I can't believe what I've seen. My hero, my countryman has been defeated. Instead, I'm shocked. Instead, this was, well, I can't believe they did that like that. Now let's find out who that devil is. And the thing is, yes, with where we're going, it makes sense that Adam Cole couldn't find the ring, right? But they just, and we know MJF is going to take time off because he's hurt. And honestly, after this whole thing is about to unfold and already has unfolded here, maybe if he's off for about a year and they forget all about it, that might be the best thing. But Cole goes to console MJF and then the devil's goons appear. And they tackle MJF, and one of them holds Cole, who's trying to fend off with the crutch, and the other three rough up MJF and hold him, and one of them's got a chair. And Cole and MJF are each saying, don't hit him, hit me! Don't hit him, hit me! And the chair guy turns to Adam Cole, and he draws back, and the lights go out. And when the lights come back on, Adam Cole is sitting in the chair and the devil stooges are all lined up behind him and they all unmask and it's Roderick Strong, Matt Taven, Mike Bennett and Wardlow. And MJF is, how could you do this? Do you remember when we... First started seeing the brochachos doing their videos at Denny's or Chili's or Spaghetti Factory or wherever they were dieting at that point. TGI Fridays. We said if Adam Cole turns on MJF, MJF is going to look like the biggest fucking moron walking the planet because nobody could take any of this acting seriously. And then you throw in Strong and Taven and Bennett and none of this has been serious. None of it has been in any way something that the babyface world champion of the company, MJF, should ever fall for in a million years. And the Adam Cole shit with the... He needed surgery, but he had to mow the lawn, but we find out they're all in Kahoot. How does any of this... And... And while I'm on the subject, they have spent... Months, the past three months at least, reinforcing that Roderick Strong, Matt Taven, and Mike Bennett are comedy characters, never win matches, can't do anything right, and act silly on camera. And now they're the henchmen of the top heel, the devil, who is crippled and can't wrestle for at least another six to nine months, probably. So it was all an act. If that's the if that's the explanation, it's even worse. They were acting like children for months and months and months to fool everyone so you wouldn't suspect 
them as the devil's associates. And then you would think that they were so stupid that they couldn't possibly pull anything off? Is that what the plan was? And Wardlow decided on his comeback the best thing was to be in another faction. Another group. Because they worked out so well for him in the past. It doesn't make any... It, what Again. Samoa Joe's so, the one that injured Roddy Strong's neck, isn't he? I think so. That's the reason he's in a neck brace was Samoa Joe choked him out. Then Samoa Joe is now on their side? Well, he was just working for them. Ah. He just took their money. He didn't want to get too much of it on him. So Adam Cole, the leader of the group, is crippled and can't wrestle. Three of the four members of his group have been painted as comedy underneath jobbers who never win matches. And they have just fucked the goddamn world champion and the only guy that, that the company had that was really kind of over still. And then they beat him up. And Wardlow powerbombed him, and they pulled out the devil mask and laid it on top of him. Thanks for coming, MJF. Please, I hope your next visit is to the Stamford train station. Unfortunately, I don't believe it will be. I think he's going to be there a little while longer. A few years longer. The best thing is that he's going to be <sighs> off TV for a while. Hopefully, like, I don't know about a year. Yeah. <laughs> But seriously, how long will it take people to forget about this? Hopefully a while, but I'm not an Adam Cole fan and I don't buy him and I could never buy him as a bad guy character ever in a million years. I don't care what he did on that show. No, remember in, in the undisputed era, they were heels in NXT and it worked in the group. And in, We've done a lot since then, haven't we? We've done a lot since then. I'll never be able to see him as a serious heel in any way. And he now has a faction made up of guys who have been <laughs> treated like comedy jobbers. And mm. Wardlow, who is maybe the biggest example of AEW booking malfeasance from a homegrown talent ever in that company. A few times, actually. This upset their fans. I shouldn't say upset. This disappointed their fans at the end of a disappointing pay-per-view. To a lot of us, it was just, <laughs> this doesn't make me want to see anything. And if, MJS, if MJF's off, who are they feuding with? Who is this faction? Is this faction? <laughs> now they're just going to go pick on someone else this week? If MJF's <laughs> injured and he's going to need them surgery, it's just not good. AEW is really not good right now. We'll play the media scrum audio shortly. Tony thinks it's great. But this hey, why, why don't uh, why don't uh, they uh, they suspend Adam Cole and all of the goons so they're suspended as long as MJF is out so they don't have to feud with anybody else? And I don't want to see MJF versus Adam Cole. Honestly, Adam Cole is smaller than like a teenager. <laughs> Any wrestler should just be able to crush him. It's like a Riho situation. So I don't. I I'm, I left this pay per view event just thinking, wow, this is the most underwhelming pay per view from AEW ever there have been pay-per-views where i've enjoyed matches and then there were some shit show matches that i at least watched and it's like oh man i can't wait to talk to jim about this shit <laughs> this wasn't that this was plotting and i will say to be honest and it's again the arena i used to always go to as a kid it is a tough room usually it's a family audience in that building for wwe that was a, one of the problems for crockett promotions as one of the problems today. But they sat there and watched this like, like a New York City crowd watching a band. <laughs> Just stood there and watched it. And the booking is so uninspiring and so bad. And who do you come out of this wanting to see more? Swerve, I guess, because he has an unresolved thing with Keith Lee, who we may never see again. And he beat up Dustin Rhodes for no good reason. Jericho, I definitely want to see Jericho. I'm dying to see the crowd reactions to Jericho. Yeah, yeah. Everywhere. He's going to go on a tour across the country with this. How is he going to try to turn this so that he could use it? That's the way he thinks. How can I make this where, you know, like a trademark, boo me, you know, whatever the fuck. <laughs> but there's not a lot. Blackpool Combat Club, dead. Eddie Kingston, I don't want to watch another Eddie Kingston match for a while. Danielson, I'm sick of Danielson. They've got me sick of Danielson. MJF appears to be off. I like Samoa Joe. I don't know who he's going to wrestle. 
How's that? Who is he going to uh, defend the title against? I, you know what? Swerve's the top. Who are we baby supposed face. to? Oh God, yeah, well, yeah, we'll cheer for Swerve. Swerve's the top baby face. I think he said he didn't win that tournament. Give him Joe. As long as he keeps committing attempted murder and aggravated mayhem, apparently Swerve will be a popular man. The best AEW matches, I think, probably in 2023 on TV were those FTR tag matches. FTR nowhere to be seen on this fucking pay per view. I forgot match. about where the fuck are. <laughs> You forgot about him. The elite, nowhere to be seen on the last pay-per-view of the year. You know, a lot of people are talking about the changing face of the company and how people are leaving. It's also just less exciting. I don't know. I, you know, the idea that it's all being booked for one man, it's truer today than ever before. Well, Brian, you know what all of those smart fans and website reporters did? immediately after this show was over with, don't you? Immediately? No, I do not know. Immediately. They got on their telephones to get on the social media and the Twitter and the internets and all of those things and tell everybody that wasn't there what had happened and try to give them the scoops. And to do that, you know what they had to have, don't you? What they had to have to give the scoops? A uh, scooper? Yeah. A scooper? No, not a pooper scooper. But a cell phone and a cell phone plan, a wireless plan, you know, because Brian, these cell phones, apparently, from what I understand, some people have these things. Now, a lot of people have them now. They're taking the country by storm. Maybe even, I don't know, half the people in the country now have a cell phone and a wireless plan. Did you realize this? Have you seen this on the news? They've been talking about it. It probably is a lot more than half the country. Everyone has a cell phone nowadays. Everyone uses a cell phone. It's how we're... Most people get rid of their home phones. They don't even have those. They only what? have cell phones. Oh, come on. Got to be out of your mind. A, a landline will never go out of fashion. Well, but you can folks, do both. If, you can do both. If you're one of these people that needs the wireless cell phone and you're wondering why your wireless bill is so damn expensive. Last month, you were worrying, why is the rent so damn high? And now you're saying, why is my wireless bill so damn expensive? Because after all, it's radio waves. How much can a radio wave really cost? And especially when, when the wind is blowing that way anyway, it ought to be cheaper. So what? what are you talking wireless, about? Well, I'm telling you, it's going to help it along. The wind's blowing what way? You don't know what way the, the wind's way, going to the blow. The way that the wireless wave, radio wave is going. But what if you're living the other direction? Well, then they may have to add a surcharge. We're going to establish this here in a moment. But some of these big companies, they're what? just charging you whatever they want to fucking charge you, and you're paying for it because you got to talk and you got to do the text messaging like the kids do, and you got to send... The pictures of your genitalia and genitalia no. to your significant other. No, it's a good idea not to do that. It may leak. Well, hey, you can go to the doctor and get a shot for that. But once again, folks, if you don't want to pay one of these big, high wireless bills, and you want to pay a low, low wireless bill, you go to our new friends that we've just met, and of course, we've checked them out thoroughly, and they're Absolutely fine people that use their left and right turn indicators. Their names are Mint Mobile. And it's going to save you a mint because they phone plans from Mint Mobile 15 bucks a month if you get a three month plan. And that's unlimited for the talking and the texting and the data, whatever that may be. And I guess that means you can send multiple pictures of your genitalia, or if it's Stop. large, you can. Send like a widescreen shot. Oh, well, stop it. There's no widescreen. The you... magnitude of it for the same price. It Again, ain't gonna, it ain't, no matter how big your phallus is, it ain't going to cost you any more for this phone plan. I'm not sure why your mind went in this direction. Well, but some people may be worried about that. Please. They may be saying, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not having to go to Hawaii to hang 10. I can just stand here and smile. I'm afraid they're going to charge me more for my telephone. That's not going to happen with Mint Mobile. No, it's not going to happen whether it is the phone calls you answer or make or the text messages that are not graphic and lewd that you send or receive. Mint Mobile will be there. And like you said, for three months, a yes. fine, fine, nice price to try it out and get in the It door. doesn't matter. If, folks, if you've got a Big Johnson, step right up. It doesn't matter. They're not going to charge you a penny more. When you step up, to the to the urinal in the men's bathroom. What? And you and you tell the guy next to you, you say, "Boy, this water is cold." And he says, "Yeah, and it's deep too." They're not going to charge you any more money, folks, because you can say bye-bye 
to your overpriced wireless plans, jaw-dropping monthly bills, unexpected overages. See right there, the unexpected overage. You take a look at it. I didn't expect it to be that big. None of this is in the copy. All the plans come with unlimited talk and text. You can talk unlimitedly. You And, and somebody will <laughs> be forced to listen to you, no matter no, how no, long no. you've grown on. No, there's no guarantee that someone will answer the phone if you make a phone call. There is no guarantee of that. Well, they've no, they've got somebody on the Mint Mobile staff. If you have unlimited talk, you can talk to them, and they have to listen until you're done. That is not true. No one should expect that. Ladies and gentlemen, if you try this great plan from Mint Mobile, our new friends at Mint Mobile, there will be no one waiting for your phone call after the uh, initial deal you make, I guess. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about, Brian. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan. You just you get this adapter. It's a large box-like thing that you stick on the back of your phone. What? And it adapts your phone to Mint Mobile. And you can bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. All your existing contacts. So everybody you know that you've ever been in contact with that's currently alive, you need to bring them along to testify no. that you're okay to get this service. The digital contacts. And bring your own phone. You got to have your own phone. They're not going to give you a goddamn phone, for fuck's sake. The digital contacts that would be in your own phone, as you put it, for God's sake. Is that like the people in the walls? No, it's the contacts. In your, let me find Jim's phone number. Let me look under J or well, C. In, in, in it what could be under J. It could be under C. In what context are you talking about these contacts? Anyway, you folks, you can ditch the overpriced wireless with Mint Mobile's limited time deal and get the premium wireless service. You're not, you're not going to have to plug anything in anywhere, apparently, for just $15 a month when you sign up for the three months. And right now, to get it, you just got to go to Mint Mobile, once again, like you're saving a mint, M-I-N-T mobile.com slash J-C-E mintmobile.com slash jce and you can cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month of course you can still leave your penis the same exact size as it is now additional taxes fees and restrictions apply not on your penis on the phone you plan see mint mobile for details mintmobile.com slash jce 15 bucks a month if you had to stand down at the corner pay phone and put in a quarter at a time why let's see uh, four calls me a dollar you get you if you make more than 60 phone calls a month you're saving money all right well we would like to welcome mint mobile to the show thank you for uh thank you for stopping by I for coming aboard back. we look forward to many more uh talking twos about <laughs> mint mobile <laughs> <laughs> i have a feeling Hazel's going to get a talking to when they hear oh, this show. That reminds me of my favorite line from when we went to that show in Louisville when Frank Morell was uh, trying to get the loser has to kiss the winner's foot <laughs> stipulation. Of course, he goes, I'm not happy with this foot and kiss. <laughs> All righty, then. It's your show. All right. It is my show. I thought it was your show. From the moment we started you this. keep having that mistaken apprehension. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's... uh. Hold on, I'm going to do this. This is a big announcement. Which one of these? I guess it would be this. No. Nope. That's not it. I don't know which ones you use. Let me go to the other one. This, and it doesn't stop. Then it just keeps going. Oh, for heaven's Now your poor workman blames his tools. Tom, tell it who. What the fuck is that? What was that? Hold on, hold on. This is listed as twaddle. Fiddle faddle. <laughs> All right. Fumble sticks and bumber shoots. All right. Let's put this down, but we are now going to move yeah, on. Yeah, put it down, Brad. Whatever you've been picking up, put it down. Yeah, you don't have to make everything about the penis here today, but speaking I, of... No, I, there was no <laughs> allusion to, to coxmanship in that at all. I said, whatever you've been picking up, put it down. It could have been the illicit substances you've been imbibing in over the holidays. <laughs> 